the Anabaptists and the cross. Now please open your Bible and read with me in Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through 38. As we read, note that at first, Peter had an incomplete understanding of the saving confession. Yes, he knew Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the King who was promised to Israel, the King who would rule the nations. But this means more than Peter understood at the time. You see, salvation begins in a proper confession, but continues into discipleship, which means following Jesus through the cross and into life. And Jesus went out with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the road, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, others Elijah, one of the prophets. But you, he asked them, who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he strictly warned them to tell no one about him. And then he began to teach them that it was necessary for the Son of Man to, and here's the key word, suffer many things. <clears throat> and he and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, be killed, and rise after three days. He spoke openly about this. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning around and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are not thinking about God's concerns, but human concerns. Calling the crowd along with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me and the gospel will save it. For what does it benefit someone to gain the whole world and yet you lose his life? What can anyone give in exchange for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation... The Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Now, during our first of this year's page lectures uh, at Southeastern Seminary, when we considered the Anabaptists in the Great Commission, uh, we heard uh, first part of the confession of an Anabaptist martyr. During this second lecture, as we consider the Anabaptists and the cross, please allow me to take a few more words from the same martyr, Thomas Van Embroek, a brilliant Bible teacher murdered for his faith at the tender age of 25. Notice that for Van Embroek, the Great Commission is not merely about a temporary experience witnessed by water baptism. For the early Anabaptists, obedience to the Great Commission of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ begins in going, in making a disciple and in baptizing the new disciple. But obedience does not end there. Obedience to the Great Commission was never about bringing a proposed convert to say a few words, getting him or her to let you dip them in the water, and then dropping them as you act, uh, set your eyes on the next evangelistic target. Evangelism does not exist as a one-time event, but as an entirely devoted life. Obedience to the Great Commission must proceed from conversion to teaching converts to obey everything Christ has commanded. Great Commission evangelism is not an exercise in a form of Gnosticism, merely knowing the truth. Nor is Great Commission evangelism an exercise in a form of Docetism, merely appearing to follow Jesus. Great Commission evangelism, according to the 16th century Anabaptists, necessarily proceeds to teaching the convert to give their whole life to Jesus. If Jesus is not your Lord, then Jesus is not your Savior. And how are others to know the depth of his Lordship unless we teach them everything he commanded? The early Anabaptists understood that the work of Jesus Christ upon his cross and in his resurrection precedes his command, the Great Commission. And they also understood that the Great Commission leads the Christian to take up their own small cross in anticipation of participating in Christ's resurrection. Listen to the confession of Van Embroek. 
So he, after receiving baptism, surrenders himself to Christ and loses his will, is resigned in all things without name, without will, but leaving the name to Christ and letting him reign in him. For this is the signification of baptism, that the Christian's life is nothing but pure dying and suffering because we are like unto the image of Christ and baptized with him, must die and suffer if we would reign and live with him. Van Embroek concludes this statement with a citation of Romans 6.4. That Pauline baptismal text reads, of course, and by the way, whenever I, I baptized as a pastor, and sometimes still have the opportunity, um, I always include Romans 6.4. For we are buried with him in baptism. That's death. And we are raised to walk in a newness of life. For the Anabaptists, this text must be taken bodily, and this text must be taken wholly in order to be understood properly. If you are buried with him in baptism, you have surrendered your life to death, and if you die with Christ, you will rise with Christ. Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so the Christian will rise from the dead and walk in new life. For the Anabaptists, the resurrection is through the cross, and that's the key idea, through the cross. Eternal life is through death with Christ, not merely in a conceptual way, but in a literal way. Another example from the Anabaptists may help you see how Christ's call to take up the cross and follow him was taken seriously. Hear the story of a woman named Apollonia. As she recorded, uh, as is recorded in the Hutterite records. As you listen, take note how her story follows a paradigm of reliance upon grace, of faith understood as faithfulness, of baptism as an entire commitment, of the cross laid upon her by God, and of the victory beyond the cross. Here's the record it's short, it's all we have of her life, it's powerful. In the year 1539, one sister, Apollonia, wife of Leonard Sailor, having been with him in the upper country, was apprehended in the earldom of Tyrol and brought to Brixen. But, but through the immutable grace and power of God, who valiantly aided her womanly heart, she constantly and firmly continued in the true faith. And in what she, had been, uh, what she had promised God in Christian baptism, and would depart neither to the right nor to the left. Hence, she was then sentenced to death and drowned, thus receiving the martyr's crown. Apollonia lived out an understanding of the Christian life that took the cross as so much more than a piece of jewelry or a sentimental icon. As I concluded in an essay that my wife, who is no mean spiritual theologian, considers to be the best Anabaptist piece I've ever written, the Anabaptist held to a cruciform spirituality, believing that the cross of Christ both saved them and provided the paradigm for their own journey through the darkness of this world and into the light of eternity. That essay, Anabaptist Spirituality, can be found in the uh, History of Christian Spirituality, a, a fish shrift uh, dedicated to Dr. Michael Haken, one of our colleagues at uh, the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. I would like to extend that previous essay by dwelling here particularly upon the Anabaptist theology of the cross in the thought of Balthazar Hubmeyer. Hubmeyer was born around 1480 in Friedberg. At the University of Freiburg, he was taught by the premier Roman Catholic apologist John Eck, the famous opponent of Martin Luther. You may have heard of him. After serving as a teacher and a priest elsewhere, Hubmeyer earned a doctorate under Eck at the University of Ingolstadt, where he eventually ascended to the place of prorector, the position of what we would call a president of a university today. He was then called to the prestigious pulpit of the cathedral at Regensburg, uh, 
where he horrifically participated in an anti-Jewish pogrom. And five years later, for unstated reasons, which probably had to do with what he later described as pride, fornication, and worldly luxury, this star academic and leading preacher left quietly to take up a post in a small South German border town known as Waldshut. There he fell under the influence of the Reformation at Zurich and ended up repenting his Roman Catholicism. He was baptized by Wilhelm Reublin on April 15, 1525, and also led his small flock to convert to Jesus Christ and to receive believers' baptism. The first publication of Hubmeier as an Anabaptist appeared on July 1st, 1525, and was entitled Summa of the Entire Christian Life, the whole of the whole Christian life, if you will. Hubmeier's conversion to true faith in Christ was powerfully described therein. His conversion shaped him in a cross-like fashion. Describing the Christian life in a programmatic five-fold movement, but first, for the benefit of, of the three churches he had previously misled, he wrote his confession, and this is his confession. It's honest. This is Augustinian in its art, honesty. I confess publicly that I have sinned against heaven and God, not only with my sinful life, which I led in all pride, fornication, and worldly luxury among you, contrary to the teaching of Christ, but also with false, ungrounded, and godless teachings, with which I instructed, fed, and tended you outside the Word of God. Wow. A university president, a megachurch pastor, confessing his sinfulness. Unheard of. He listed those false teachings, including infant baptism, the mass, pilgrimages, sacrifices, salvation by works. He admitted he had been deceived by Rome, which he described with apocalyptic color as the red whore of Babylon, with her school teachings, laws, and fables. Hubeyer encouraged his former churches to search the Scriptures and see if what he was about to tell them was true or not. He was convinced the Word of God had the power to change them as it had changed him. The preaching of the Word of God accompanied by the Holy Spirit would, he believed, bring them to repentance. The preaching of the Word had in his presentation a Pauline and a Lutheran cast to it, but also a synoptic gospel cast. Here is the fivefold paradigm that he puts forward for the whole of the Christian life. The law of Christ, the grace of God, entering the covenant, bearing the cross, remembering the cross. So the law of God, the grace of God, entering the covenant, bearing the cross, remembering the cross. Let's follow him in each of these. Number one, the law of God. The word is composed of the law and the spirit, or you could say judgment and grace, or law and gospel. Now, the doctrines of the law reveal the sickness and point to the physician. The laws of God are letter and they kill. So first, the Christian life begins with judgment, lament, and despair. A person must hear the Word of God as Jesus calls you, in Mark's version of the Great Commission, to repent or change your lives and believe the gospel. It is necessary for a person to look into his or her heart and remember what you have done and what you did not do, sins of commission and sins of omission. If a person is honest and listens to God, rather than cutting off the conviction, you will discover within yourself no health at all but rather poison, wounds, and all impurity which cling to us from the beginning because we are conceived and born in sin. Original sin is so devastating that it removes any hope from man that he could save himself. A person finds in himself neither help, comfort, nor medicine with which he could help himself. Rather than seeing hope in a human capacity or an anthropological constituency, one must despair of himself. It is here that one detects the Reformation commitment to the Augustinian definition of sin and grace. Sin is so prevalent within us that only God himself can solve the human problem. 
Repentance begins in desperation, which itself is a gift. The recognition of your own incapacity, your need for the radical free grace of God to save you, the sinner, in spite of you. Only after the work of mortification by the Word of God is one ready for the work of vivification by Jesus Christ. Which brings us to the second part of his paradigm. Number two, the grace of God. Hummeyer's description of the gracious work of God in saving him by his word and by his spirit follows the metaphor of Jesus as a physician and the Holy Spirit as the internal agent of salvation. Baltazar provides a powerful description that gives one the impression he is still overwhelmed by his recent conversion. Jesus, he says, like the Good Samaritan, brings with him the medicine of wine and oil. And with the wine, Jesus leads the person to repentance so that he is sorry for his sins. Then, with the oil, he softens the wound and drives the pain away with the gospel, saying, believe the gospel that clearly shows that I, Jesus, am your physician who has come into this world to make the sinner just and righteous. I am the only giver of mercy, reconciler, intercessor, mediator, and peacemaker toward God, our Father, so that whoever believes in me will not be damned but have eternal life. That's the gospel. At the same time that the Word of God is bringing the gospel outwardly to the ears of those being, said, being saved, by faith the Spirit of God makes them alive so that they start to live, turn green, and bear fruit. One must recognize that Hubmeyer, like the magisterial reformers, pictures the human being as utterly dependent upon the Word of God and the Spirit of God working by grace in the gospel. However, unlike them, Hubmeyer also makes a huge deal about entirely surrendering one's life to Christ. Discipleship is not pushed back in the Ordo Salutis, the order of salvation, in an unnecessary attempt Hubmeyer would argue, for preserving divine sovereignty. The grace of salvation entails the submitted life. Salvation begins and continues with the whole person wholly dedicated to following Christ. Through Christ's words of comfort, the sinner is enlivened again, comes to himself, becomes joyful, and henceforth, he says, surrenders himself entirely to the physician. Through the work of the Spirit, this person surrenders himself inwardly in the heart and intention unto a new life according to the rule and teaching of Christ, the physician who has made him whole, from whom he received life. While there is evidently a Reformation evangelical dependence upon God's grace through faith in Christ, there is also manifestly a Reformation Anabaptist dependence upon God's grace to show itself in faithfulness to Christ. Number three in his paradigm, entering the covenant. If a person has true faith, there is a seamless movement into covenantal commitment to Christ within the church of Christ. After the person has now committed himself inwardly, he says, and in faith to a new life, he then professes this also outwardly and publicly before the Christian church and to whose communion he lets himself be registered and counted according to the order and institution of Christ. Again, by the word and the spirit, he has surrendered himself to live henceforth according to the word, will, and there's that phrase again, rule of Christ, to arrange and direct his doing and leaving undone according to him and also to fight and strive under his banner until death. And the Christian's banner, his flag, her flag is the cross. Entering the covenant begins with baptism and continues with submission to communal discipleship. That is church discipline. When you're baptized, you agree to be disciplined for your own good. He says he lets himself be baptized with outward water in which he professes publicly his faith and his intention. His faith is that he is a gracious father in heaven who satisfied him through his son, alluding, by the way, to the satisfaction theory of the atonement. His intention is henceforth to change and amend his life. And if he in the future 
quote, blackens or shames the faith and name of Christ with public sins, he herewith submits and surrenders to the brotherly discipline according to the order of Christ, Matthew 18, 15 and following, he says. So, the rule of Christ begins with entering the church covenant through baptism upon the profession of faith, which also requires submission to church discipline. Entering the covenant then leads to the fourth part of the entire Christian life actually living it. This life is described as a work of triune grace, as commitment to witness to Christ, as daily mortification and sanctification, as, to sum it all up, bearing the cross. So number four, bearing the cross that Christ gives. As with the beginning of the Christian life, so with the continuance of the Christian life. Everything is due to grace. Entering and fulfilling the covenant occurs only through divine grace. This pledge, promise, and public testimony, he says, does not happen out of human powers or capacities, for that would be presumptuousness or human arrogance. The Christian life from beginning to end is a work of divine grace. Triune grace. It rather, he says, takes place in the name of God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is, in the grace and power of God, for it is a power. So the priest empowering ex opera operato or opera operatum of the Roman sacraments that this priest once proclaimed has been replaced entirely by divine grace. This is an Anabaptist reformer. As a reformer, like the magisterial reformers, he is committed doctrinally to grace. As an Anabaptist, he is committed doctrinally also to a holistic Christianity, to discipleship, to bearing the cross. He is committed to salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. He is also committed to following Christ in his salvation. As Hutmeyer said, he has also committed to live henceforth according to the word and order of Christ, but not out of human capacity. There is a dialectic at work in the true Christian life. The cross of Christ saves by grace through faith, and Christ gives a cross to the one who has been given faith. One thinks here of Philippians 1.29, it is given to you to believe. There's grace. And to suffer, there is cross. We like to emphasize grace, don't we? But the apostle made sure we understood the cross as well. The cross is grace. That sounds so counterintuitive. The cross is grace the grace of God. And your cross is the witness to the gospel. That's really where it shows itself in our lives as we witness to the gospel. He says, now the person bursts into word and deed, proclaims and magnifies the name and praise of Christ so that also through us others may be healed and saved. As we have also come to faith through others who previously preached Christ to us, in order that the kingdom of Christ may be increased. The cross of Christ leads to the Great Commission. And the Great Commission leads to the cross of the Christian. He continues, here follows persecution. The cross and all tribulation because of the gospel in the world, which hates light and life and loves the darkness. So why does the world persecute the follower of Christ? Not because it wants to be unrighteous. I think sometimes when we respond to the world, we have easy answers that fit and make us look good. This is not why the world rejects Christ. No, they despise Christ's form of righteousness, the cross. The world rejects faith in the cross of Christ, and it rejects the cross that Christ lays upon the faithful. 
The world thinks it can be saved through following laws and rules rather than following what Humeyer called the unattractive, plain, and simple rule of Christ. The world thinks it can save itself through obedience to laws, but it can only be saved by grace through faith in the cross of Christ. So why does the Anabaptist do good works then? Not in order to be saved, but because she has been saved. The right order of a Christian life, Meyer says, begins in the Word, continues through conviction of sin, and forgiveness through faith. But the order does not stop there. The right order of a Christian life continues into good works. And truly good works are only those which Christ has commanded. That's what's good, obeying Christ. And you can only obey by the grace of God, the work of the Holy Spirit. And God will hold us accountable in the end for our works. This leads Hubmeyer to the fifth and final part of his description of the whole Christian life. Number five, remembering the cross of Christ. The Christian life begins with faith in Christ and with baptism outwardly. It continues with daily mortification of sins and sanctification by the Holy Spirit as the Christian witnesses to the world and performs good works according to Christ's definition only, all of which is described by Hubmeyer as bearing the cross. Hubmeyer later refers to the Christian's cross as the small cross, distinguishing the Christian's cross from the Christ's cross. Toward the end of his Anabaptist ministry, which did not last very long, for Hubmeyer had his own cross to bear in front of him. In 1527, he wrote of the difference between Christ's cross and the Christian's cross. For where Christ is and dwells, there he brings the cross with him on his back, from which he gives every Christian his own small cross to carry and to follow after him. We are to expect this small cross, and if it comes, accept it with joy and patience. And do not pick and choose your own chips of the cross in false spirituality, selecting and gathering them up without divine understanding. But immediately after his conversion, Hubmeyer had already spelled out how the cross of Christ was be, to be remembered and revered. There is a difference between the cross of Christ and the cross of the Christian. You are saved alone by the cross of Christ, and you are given a cross from Christ to bear with him. The cross of Christ, where the righteous blood flows to save the sinner, is continually placed before the mind of the follower of Christ during the community's celebration of the Lord's Supper. So the Lord's Supper is as important as baptism in the covenantal churches of the Anabaptist. My students still find Hubmeyer's description of the Anabaptist celebration of the Lord's Supper biblically faithful, personally compelling, and worthy of emulation. You really should read it. It can be found in his 1527, A Form for Christ's Supper. But let us return to the 1525 summa of the Christian, entire Christian life. There are two major aspects to the cross of Christ as remembered by Hubmeyer in the fifth and continually celebrated aspect of the Christian life. The cross of Christ is substitutionary and sanctifying. He clearly holds to a memorial view of the Lord's Supper, keeping to the Zwinglian understanding. He says the supper is nothing other than a memorial of the suffering of Christ. But it is a meaningful memorial, not a mere memorial. And its meaning is found in substitution. On the cross, Christ suffered for our sake. He, quote, offered his body for our sake and shed his crimson blood on the cross to wash away our sins. Hubmeyer's emphasis upon the cross of the Christian is grounded in the satisfaction penal substitutionary and Christus Victor theories of the atonement. Christ's cross is primary. The Christian's cross is derivative. He's got the big cross. He graces us with small crosses.
The cross of Jesus Christ, moreover, leads to our sanctification. Remember, he said his crimson blood on the cross washes away our sins. Continuing the emphasis on grace, he maintains from beginning to end that the Christian life is a work of grace, sanctifying grace. But Hubmeyer is not going to stop with Christ's cross as for the then and there. He will remind us that Christ's cross is also for the here and now. To summarize, in his rumination on the Lord's Supper, Hubmeyer points out that the Christian's cross, the small cross, comes from Christ. It calls us to surrender to Christ. It requires us to serve our neighbor in loving witness. It calls for us to serve our neighbor in bodily ways. It is born only by grace. It is difficult to bear. And it is bound up with our evangelism, our confession. He concludes with a compilation from Matthew chapter 10. He who confesses me before people, Jesus says, him will I confess before God my Father. Whoever denies me before people, him I will deny before God. Do not fear those who take the body from you, which is more than earthly goods, but fear him who can take both your body and soul and cast you into eternal damnation. When I was young, these were called uh, the difficult sayings of Jesus, the hard sayings of Jesus. Why? Because they challenge bad theology. (laughs) That's why they're difficult. They challenge bad ethics. They challenge false Christianity. That's why they're hard. They call us out. Although Hubmeyer struggled with being faithful at times, especially when he was put on the rack in Zurich and recanted before Zwingli in early 1526. And then later, when he was tortured, then interrogated by the Roman Catholic theologian John Faber in 1528. Both Zwingli and Faber had at one time been his friends and colleagues. He went to school with Faber. He learned theology from Zwingli, his classmate, his professor. The Anabaptist leader was persecuted by both the Reformed and the Romans, but he continued to maintain the faith, and on March 10, 1528, he was burned alive at the stake in Vienna near the river. Humeyer knew that bearing witness to Christ might lead him to the cross, and he bore the cross in witness in life and in death. His final words sound throughout the centuries to remind us that the grace of God is inextricably bound up with the cross of Christ. You cannot bear the cross that God has put upon your life unless he gives you the grace to do it. Listen to Hubmeyer. His wife encouraged him. She was, as Sprugel comments, even firmer in her faith than her husband. I don't know about you, but Dr. Ashford, my wife is much firmer and stronger in the faith than I am. It's a blessing to have a wife like that. And when Hubmeyer was taken to the site of execution on the 10th of March, 1528, he spoke words of comfort to himself by reciting Bible verses. When he arrived at the scaffold, accompanied by a great crowd of people and followed by an armed company, He raised his voice and cried out in the Swiss dialect, Oh, my gracious God, grant me grace in my great suffering. Grace to suffer. Turning to the people, he asked pardon if he had offended anyone, and he pardoned his enemies. And when the wood was already in flames, he cried out, Oh, my heavenly Father, oh, my gracious God. And when his hair and his beard burned, he was crying out, Oh, Jesus, choked by the smoke, he died. A few days later, Elizabeth Hugelin Hubmeyer, his dear wife, was thrown into the Danube with a stone tied around her neck, joining her husband on the cross. 
But the story of Balthazar and Elizabeth Hubmeyer did not end in March 1528. For like the Dutch Anabaptist Thomas van Embroek, the South German Anabaptist Balthazar Hubmeyer knew that he and we must die and suffer if we would reign and live with him. As historians like Timothy George, Trip York, and Ethelbert Stauffer likewise discovered, the Anabaptists embraced the biblical truth that the Christian is called to a life of cross-bearing. The pathway to heaven sojourns through suffering and death. Paul wrote, we are buried with him in baptism. We are raised to walk in newness of life. Stauffer put this truth into a Latin axiom, per crucem et lucem, through the cross to the light. Per crucem et lucem, through the cross to the light. It is only by fixing our eyes upon the cross of Christ that we see the glory. As the 20th century Lutheran martyr Dietrich Bonhoeffer put it in his famous The Call to Discipleship, when God calls a man, he bids him come and die. And through death, we are granted life. Let me end the second part of the hymn we cited in our first lecture on the Anabaptists and the Great Commission. Remember, this hymn was used during the commissioning of Anabaptist missionaries. It began with the call to follow Christ in fulfilling the Great Commission of Matthew 28, and it ended with the reminder that the call is to follow Christ through the cross of Mark 8. And if thou, Lord, desire, and should it be thy will, that we taste sword and fire, by those who thus would kill. Then comfort, pray, our loved ones, and tell them we've endured, and we shall see them yonder, eternally secured. Thy word, O Lord, does teach us, and we do understand. Thy promises are with us until the very end. Thou hast prepared a heaven, praised be thy holy name. We laud thee, God of heaven, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you.